I'm going to leave them this asset that creates income, but also creates this other big pot of non-taxable money to them. But it only it only works really, really well for a really small section of the population. And it's only simple at the beginning. Right. <laughs> Well, I want to know about this wizardry that you, uh, that you espouse here. We're going to create tax-free income with tax-free income. Yeah. Yeah. So, so the, I mean, that sounds super special. I, l l let me, let's, let's talk through this for a second. So tax-free wealth, great mm -hmm. thing. Yep. But what if we had tax-free income that we use to create tax-free wealth? That's like, the I meta, mean, right. That's the hat trick. The yeah. greatest thing in the world. Mm -hmm. So we're we're actually going back through the archives on this one because while it sounds brand new, it's been around for a long time. There's nothing new in the financial services industry, is there? No, no, there isn't. It's all just rehashed ideas there. that everyone forgot about. Well, the thing is, the 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 truth of the matter is, they're good ideas. A lot right. of them. Um, right. And this one is a good idea. They are. Um, God, what am I trying? They're cyclical. And what I mean by that is their effectiveness. Like bell-bottom mm. pants? <laughs> no, those should never, ever, ever come back. <laughs> but I've noticed that they seem to be coming back. We go from extremes. We go from skinny leg, paint on jeans to, to bell-bottom. So this is happening. Uh, no, this is an old idea whose time has come around again because of environmental factors that make it favorable. Yeah. That's, that's what I mean by that in the financial services industry. We sort of, there's an evolution of ideas depending on the climate of the time. And I don't mean the weather. I mean, interest rates, in particular, product availability, costs, all those sorts of things. And so we just thought this is an idea whose time has come back around. Yeah. Now, why, why do we think that? Because we decided it. That's why. We but, did. We did. And we had to record something. So, <laughs> so don't, uh, don't reveal, don't reveal all the secrets. <laughs> <laughs> There's any number of ways you could generate income for wealth building purposes. Right. And when it comes to using products, assets like life insurance, one of the key attractive features is the fact that you can build tax-free wealth with it. Because right. the, the cash that you accumulate inside of a cash value life insurance policy, be it whole life, be it universal life insurance, it is going to accumulate with no tax liability due on the accumulation. Right. And you can also access the cash either through a, a basis withdrawal or a policy loan to avoid incurring any sort of income tax on that. Right. And then the death benefit itself transfers to whomever you name as the beneficiary income tax free. Right. So there's a lot of tax free stuff going on with life insurance. Yeah. Now, absolutely. That's all great. But in general, the income that you're going to have to, let's say, pay the premium on a life insurance policy, that is going to be ordinary income. You're going to pay taxes Correct. on that. Yeah. So much, much, a, to, much to every person who's ever reached out to us looking for a, a way to deduct their costs. Yes. Of, yes uh, to, to make yes. their life insurance premiums tax deductible. Right. No. No. So there's a netting of, of uh, income there. Like you got. X amount of dollars of income, you're going to have to pay the income tax first, and then it goes to life insurance. And the good news is after that, it won't have an income tax liability to it. That's right. cool. Right. Now, there is a way around this, though. And mm. the way around it is to generate non-income taxable income first. Right. Or non-taxable income. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, fun just, with words podcast. Just call me grammarly, sir. <laughs> uh, so the easiest way to do this mm. that has been done numerous times over many years is the income that is derived from municipal bonds. Mm. And if you think about this, if you're in a position where you own a couple hundred thousand dollars worth of municipal bonds. Right. You collect an income from that. Right. And that income is non-income taxable. Right. You own it in this. It's, a, it's something issued in the state that you live in, so you don't have state income tax. They're always exempt from federal income tax. Right. Right. So Some are even exempt from alternative minimum tax. Yeah. So. Yep. In that case, you collect income 
that you don't have to worry about tax liability on. Right. Now, when you collect income from a municipal bond, you could take it, you could go spend it on whatever you want to. Yep. Or you might save it. But if you save it, the savings that you create with the municipal bond income are, uh, may eventually incur its own income tax. Sure. Because the ability, what you do with it. the ability to take that income and just roll it into more municipal bonds, it's not impossible, but it's not the easiest thing in the world to do. Right. Because there, have to, there, there has to be municipal bonds to buy. Right. They have to be ones that you find attractive. Right. And generally speaking, if you buy into a municipal bond issuance, it's not like you can go back a year later and say, hey, I want more of that bond. Right. Once it's issued, it's issued. Right. You may be able to find some people in the secondary market who want to sell it to you, but that's, that's not that easy to do. So. And it doesn't mean you'll buy at the same yield. Correct. Correct. So most people who collect municipal bond income, they may save that income, but it generally doesn't just automatically go back into municipal bonds. Right. Unless it's a muni bond fund, which really doesn't work the way that we're talking about in this context, mm -hmm. because the dividend yield on that's going to fluctuate. Right. So one thing someone might do is just use it to make other investments. They could be stock investments. They could be uh, saving it in a, a savings account and just collecting interest. Right. But if you take that municipal bond in income and you use it to buy life insurance, now you're taking non-taxable income and putting it in a non-taxable asset. Yes. With compound growth. Mm -hmm. Guaranteed compound growth, I should add. Right. That has no tax liability on the growth, no tax liability on the distributions, provided that you do it correctly, and why wouldn't you? And right. no taxability, no income taxability on the death benefit. That you leave and, to whomever and you not included to. in your provisional income calculation for the taxability of your social security. Mm -hmm. hmm. Which is actually right. one, one better than municipal bonds. Yep. Yep, it is. So. So that's it. That's, that's the that, whole I mean, story. yeah, good. <laughs> we'll Thanks see. for stopping by. Shortest podcast we've recorded ever. <laughs> it, it seems super obvious and simple. And. Mm -hmm. What's funny about this is when, when I first started at The Guardian, mm -hmm. this was like hot topic at the time. And what, what had happened was, one, Guardian's based in New York City, so they're just like, throw a rock, you're going to find somebody who's got money in a muni bond collecting tax-free income. Right. Um, but this was, this was a big hot-button issue for them. They even commissioned um, – guy out in california to write a white paper on on this whole concept and the idea here was you really have an opportunity to take income from a tax-free nature and create a tax-free asset with it which has all sorts of really great implications to it right one eventually your muni bonds are going to reach maturity so the income is going to go away now the right. good news is you're going to get your principal back and you could roll it into an additional muni, muni bond. Sure. But what you had going up to that point, that's going to end and you're going to figure it out after that. The good news is if you take all of that tax-free income and save it in a tax-free asset, life insurance, now you have the ability to create additional tax-free income from the life insurance if you just don't find any great opportunities with your, your principal on the, the, that you use to buy the muni bonds. Right. Now, generally speaking, there's always going to be somewhere you can park that money for municipal bond purchase purposes, right. but they may not be as attractive as they were however many years ago you bought your last issuance. Sure, sure. And you may have reason to believe that things are going to change and the attractiveness of buying municipal bonds maybe two years from now is going to be a lot higher. So you don't want to commit that money today. You'd much rather wait, but mm -hmm. you'd still like some tax-free income. Well, now the life insurance policy can be that source of tax-free income in the meantime. Right. So you could switch it, basically. Yep. Sort of go back and forth. Yeah. Now think about it from this context. I should stop hitting my camera. Sorry. <laughs> think about it from this context. Mm -hmm. um, you know, a number of people who have income from bonds, they, they collect the income, but the principal itself, they have no intention of ever spending. Right. So in their eyes, that's going to go. I would say that's absolutely true of bond buyers. Yep. It that's going to go somewhere mm -hmm. to somebody. And a lot of those people tend to be very legacy oriented. Correct. Yes. So I'm looking to build an asset that I can leave to my kids that will continuously put them in a better financial situation as time goes on because they're going to inherit this, this money. It's really going to come to them probably as bonds, and they're going to collect the income that this produces when I'm gone. Right. 
So I have set this up to ensure a certain amount of income for them for theoretically the rest of their life. Right. Mm -hmm. Now think about this in the context of I'm going to leave them this asset that creates income, but also creates this other big pot of non-taxable money to them. Right. So what they could do. I.e. the life insurance. Yeah. Yep. What they could do is collect the the bonds in, in their income, but they could also collect the life insurance death benefit. And now they go out and buy even more, more bonds. bonds and <laughs> up yeah. the income that they can produce. Right. Yeah. I mean, let's say you took $40,000 a year in income from municipal bonds and bought a life insurance policy that has a million dollar death benefit. Mm-hmm. So now they're going to have the principal of the bonds. Yep. They're going to have the income from the bonds and they got an additional million bucks. Really, really quick math would suggest if, if you're if you're getting, let's say 40000 is the entire yield, probably about a million dollar. <laughs> I know. Worth of bonds. I was, I was hoping you weren't going to do that, Matt. Well, a million dollars worth of bonds plus another million dollars. So yeah. they've doubled the right. amount of money that they've got, which means if they could go and buy at roughly the same yield, they're going to double the income that their bond position creates for them. Again, tax free. Right. And it didn't cost them a million dollars to do it. Nope. That's, that's, that's the key. Now, someone might ask, well, what's the pivotal moment? Like, how do you, how do you make this work? To which I would answer. You start with a million dollars. Yeah. Buy yourself some municipal bonds. Yeah, let, let's <laughs> let's let's be very um out in the open on this. This this generally is not something that middle class Americans no. execute. They're just not gonna be able to. No. That's, that's um, not a that's not a judgment on where you are. Nope. nope. But we talk about different topics to suit different groups of people. This mm-hmm. is this is this is a, a, a one of those times where this applies to people who have a significant pile of assets. They may be inherited. It could be someone could have inherited a million dollars from mm-hmm. someone. Um, it doesn't have to be a million dollars. Just I, I looked at sort of going going yields for municipal bonds yeah. at around 5% right now, which is, I, I mean, I used to sell a fair number of municipal bonds. And from my experience, long term, if you get a 5% yield on municipal bonds, that's that's about the pinnacle of Municipal good. bonds. Yeah. I mean, I'm not saying that I've never seen any higher, but that's But you do have good. to wonder if they start to drift much higher than that, is there default risk? Default risk and, taking on. and or they're going to be called. Yep. When yeah, interest okay, rates yes. yep. go lower, yep. they'll refinance the bond issue. Correct. Um, and yeah, look, not to, not to go too far down that trail, but um, I have seen people's municipal bonds default. I've, I've had people, um, none that I ever sold, thank God, but some that people owned who were clients of mine in the past. And it's really interesting because you, you have to be careful about paying a, t- a lot of people will just say, well, that's issued by the city of blah, blah, blah. So that's a general obligation blonde and this and that and the other. But there's a lot of them that are, you need to read sort of further into the details. It's like, well, actually this is a, a revenue bond based on that new airport infrastructure expansion project. And it's, you know, supported by X, Y, and Z. So it's sort of, it is a municipal bond, but it's issued under this sort of weird little subset. And so the municipality is protected from it if it goes bad. And I'm just saying, be careful, not trying to go too far. Yeah, no, no, that, that that, that's, that's a very good discussion because I think it's, it, it's, it's, it's necessary in the context of this because there may be some people who who hear this podcast who already own muni bonds. They're already pretty well seasoned in that world, and they go, oh, yeah. yeah, you're right. I could take the, not the tax-free income and just buy life insurance and create tax-free wealth. That's cool. But there's also some people out there who don't own municipal bonds who are in a position to buy them, but they've never bought municipal bonds before. And buying bonds, as we have mentioned a time or 25, is much more complicated when you're buying the direct issue or just – or buying in secondary market, you could do that too. But buying bonds themselves is not like buying stocks. You just have to evaluate it differently. Far more yeah. complex area with far less mm. easy ability to to diversify your holdings and far less access to information yep. about. And when it comes to munis- so. when it comes to municipal bonds, there are some some unique nuances that you want to understand. And and to your point, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but but in general general obligation bonds are sort of the most highly coveted yeah, because, because they are going to get paid 
Right. Kind of regardless. Yep. Because when it when you're looking at bonds, subordination is your mm-hmm. is one mm-hmm. of the things you're very concerned about. Like who are the people that are going to get their money back first if this yep. thing goes? I'm I'm trying to think of an easy way to explain it. Who are the people that are going to get paid first if this thing goes belly up? A general obligation is putting the issuing municipality, county, state, whatever it is, on the hook. Like it's it's sort of like having your money in the general portfolio of a of a life insurance company. Like you're participating in, in everything that goes on. The insurance company at the top has responsibility for honoring these obligations. That's okay. the way general obligation bonds work. So you can also have revenue bonds. Yep. That's where um, I wanted to go next was yeah. to to point out. Go which ahead. Are, which are tied oftentimes to like t- toll roads. That's mm-hmm. that's one of the things I can think of that's I used to see all the time. Now the interesting the interesting thing is if you have a toll road near you that's been around for a while, you should research. Is that is that debt still outstanding? Because this toll road's been here for like <laughs> 35 years. I, I thought this was only a 30-year obligation. I'm not really sure. Um, and what you'll find is a lot of times those have been paid off years ago, but eh, municipal government likes to find other those. reasons to collect. Yes, yeah. yes. This happened in Atlanta. I don't remember how long ago it was. 10 years ago or more? There had been a toll road north of the city for a long time. And eventually someone asked the question, like, what, this, this should be paid for. Like, why are we still paying? The t-? And within like the next week, the tolls were gone. Oh, huh. <laughs> like, oh, you caught us. <laughs> Darn it. Turn that off now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. So the, 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 some municipal bonds are specifically tied to revenue created by the project. Right. So Which if the revenue. The project needs to work. Basically. If the revenue doesn't happen, right. then default is far easier. Correct. And there's nothing that you can do with regards to the 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 general municipality right. because they are shielded from the obligation right. because this was debt this was issued, underwritten contingent a, on the yeah. ability for the project to afford Absolutely. the the endeavor. Correct. Yep. And this it's is important super to understand basic. That. Some 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 bond salesmen or bond traders watching this and have going into convulsions is the way we're explaining this. But well, we're trying to be as as friendly to to an yep. audience that doesn't necessarily do this every day. Right. So that's important to differentiate when it comes to, to purchasing uni bonds. Yep. But generally speaking, you can use them as a source of tax free income to then create additional tax free wealth. Right. And if you are somebody who is sitting on probably a half million dollars or more. Right. In money somewhere, cash, brokerage account, wherever. Mm-hmm. Uh, not 401k, because that would make it much harder to, to make this sort of purchase. Right. Um, if not impossible. But if you have that sort of cash on hand, it is something that you can pretty easily employ. Yeah. And I'm, I'm using numbers like that, because in order to go out and buy these things, you're generally going to have to find somebody who can facilitate the purchase for you. Right. Bank, brokerage style company that specializes in this. And they're not going to talk to somebody who shows up with $25,000. No. So you got to have enough money for those people to be willing to work with you to do this. Yeah. And I'm not saying it's impossible to go to a local municipality that you know a project's going on and, and say, hey, who do I got to talk to to buy some of the debt that's being issued Don't for this do project? That. That's not going to work. <laughs> good luck making they, that work efficiently. They will, they will know what they're talking about. They yeah. just won't understand it. So. Right. Yeah. The the best thing you can do is you, you pretty much have to go through. I, I think some of the online trading platforms, you can do it. You have to do a broker assisted. I don't think you can do it electronically online. You have to call in and there's some transaction fee. Plus there's always built in fee. Anyway, let's not get well, into bond when pricing. To bonds, and, when it comes yeah. to bonds, the, the, the price can be marked up by the, yeah. the, Correct. the broker, the underwriter, the whomever. So in that case, and you won't know it. It doesn't clear like stocks do. Right. Um, and technically speaking, there's some margin in there that you don't know about when you trade on sure. Fidelity or T D or any of those places. Correct. But bonds are are they've got more more liberty to to mark that up for their benefit. Yep. Exactly. That doesn't make it a bad deal. It's just no. no. That's just the way the market works. Correct. I think that one of the, the other things that might be really appealing to people is to think about this in terms of, this was something we were talking about when we were getting ready for this episode. Think about this in terms of, of a limited funding, funding period. So I would, if I were going to use municipal bond income to pay for a life insurance policy, I might think about something like a 10 pay. Okay. Now, 
whether you actually buy a policy that has 10 pay in the title is irrelevant. Brandon and I typically don't play that game yep. because you can make any whole life policy paid up after 10 years, after seven technically, but 10. Some companies don't like for you to talk about it, but it, it but exists. It there. It's, it's a real thing. built in part of yep. participating in whole life insurance to make the policy more efficient. We don't have to get into all the details of that, but I, I think I would be comfortable with thinking about it on a limited basis. You know, put put your money in for something like 10 years, take the municipal bond income, pay the life insurance premium for 10 years, reduce pay up the policy, reduce the death benefit, however you're going to work that, and then leave the policy alone for a while. Don't okay. don't immediately start taking income from it unless you have to. I mean, if you have to, mm-hmm. you have to. That's totally fine. But I would I would try to let that thing sit there for at least another five years, preferably 10. Okay. If you can give it time to to grow, you're just going to benefit greatly. And the death benefit will continue to grow. So If you ever do end up yeah, taking income. Maybe you don't it. need to. The a, cool a thing is you still are... have the municipal bond income right. and you still have the right. principal. So you, it's fantastic. A lot of people in this situation are probably either looking to leave this behind to someone. Sure. Or they're looking to create, let's say, an emergency source of capital. Maybe. Yeah. That doesn't have income tax implications to it. Because they got, they got plenty of other assets and other places, but it might be tricky to access that without s- several machinations that you don't want to deal with. Right. Capital gains tax or things of that nature. So life insurance could be a way to create a pretty substantial sum of money that's highly liquid, but just doesn't come with any sort of logistical headaches when it comes to, well, if I need $150,000 in a pinch, I can get $150,000 in a pinch and I don't have to worry about any increase in tax liability or how it's going to affect this other thing that's going on in my life. I just, I just have it. And that's, that's, that's where you start to realize that there's, there's a lot more about this than any one individual attribute. Right. And the implications, strategically speaking, they're many and they're varied. And it, it's, it's just one of those great things to have lying around. Yep. There's, there's even possible tax to, Reduction opportunities that come up with something like this, where somebody says, all right, I'm going to take my tax-free municipal bond income, I'm going to buy life insurance with it and create a death benefit, but then I'm going to commit, let's say, the death benefit to um, my alma mater, my church, my whatever, and that may go a long way in reducing possible taxes, maybe income, maybe transfer tax liability. Right. So, there's a lot of, of additional strategy here that you can use because you have tax-free income sources that can create a tax-free asset that can also generate other taxable benefits to you. Right. From an estate level perspective, right? Yep. Yeah. Yep. Mm-hmm. This thing goes deep in terms of what it can potentially do. Right. Well, I've called it, I've, I've, I've said this before, but permanent life insurance don't care whether it's whole life or index universal life insurance, either of those is fine, is a financial Swiss army knife. It can do different things at different times in your life for different purposes. And you can change beneficiaries. You can change ownership. You have a lot of flexibility. It's one of the reasons that we've always laughed a little bit at the very sort of straightforward, uh, somewhat nonsensical finance people who will just immediately dismiss things like whole life insurance. Mm -hmm. And they often dismiss it in the context of, well, you know, if you took that money and you put it in the S&P 500, you'd have more cash. You'd have more account balance. Which no one ever has argued. That's that's all fine. Um, We believe that. There may be reasons that we would still use whole life insurance as an accumulation tool for retirement income. Yeah. But there's a lot of other things we can do with life insurance that are going to be very difficult to accomplish with the SPY or the VOO. Look, I drive a four-wheel drive pickup truck. I like to drive fast, so why do I not drive a 911? Because I can't go down a dirt road. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, it's, it's like it's not better or worse. That's the thing. It's just... What is the purpose? What are you trying to do? What is it that you want to do? And and I the problem with s- suggesting that all the money go into an, an S and P five hundred index fund to me is always it's just overly simplistic. Yeah, and I, and I realize that's the elegance of it in a lot of ways. It really is simple, but it only it only works really really well for a really small section of the population. And it's only simple at the beginning, right? Like it's really easy to understand. Mm-hmm. 
take the money, put it in the index fund, look at a historical chart of the index fund and say, oh, gee, I'll be rich. Yeah. But once you actually own it, once you've actually accumulated that money, there's a lot of things that the the really simple explanation about what you should do didn't didn't bring up. Right. There's, there's a number of things that you didn't think about, a number of things that you never really conceived happening in, in a reality that is quite different once you've gone from having no money to having a couple million bucks in an, an S&P 500 index fund. Right. And now when you're in that circumstance, there's a whole bunch of additional complications. Yeah. So what seemed like a very simple thing in the beginning gets really, really tricky and, and just as complicated as any of the other options that were on the table. Right. You may go, what I'd really like to have is a million of that two million in municipal bonds. Mm -hmm. But now I have to sell a million dollars worth of my S&P 500 index fund. And Plus, what's, to net out the... Yeah. There you go. It, 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 the, the issues cascade upon themselves. Um, mm -hmm. because life is a dynamic force. Things change. Mm -hmm. Life situations change. People's attitudes change. What you need from your investment portfolio changes. And the complexity could be something as silly as, well, when I bought into this, I lived in Florida. Right. Where I had no mm -hmm. income tax. And then for some reason, I moved to North Carolina, where there is. Right. And I'm this is really bad because I don't know that there's necessarily a, a, a what the tax capital gains is in, in North Carolina, but I suspect there probably is since there's an income tax. There is in Vermont. Let's say for some reason you decided you love cold winters that are dark and you move from Florida to Vermont. Um, now you've gone from zero capital gains tax liability for selling that million dollars worth of SPY to, I believe, eight and three quarters percent yep. tax liability if you sell that million dollars capital gains tax on, on it. So that changes things. Yes, it does. It changes things considerably. So if you can start out with a million bucks worth of municipal bonds, <clears throat> you can fund your life insurance policy. You can. You actually with tax -free don't, income. You don't have to have a million bucks. No. We're just talking about the concept. And I think it's, yeah. I think it's worthwhile, if for nothing else, than to get people to get the wheels turning about how can I get more of what I want and less of what I don't.